If you turn back in your Bibles, please, to page 490, and we are going to this evening look at the book of Esther, and I encourage you with nimble fingers to follow me as we work through the whole of the book, the whole narrative in this one sermon. Please join me in prayer. Our ever-living God, we thank you so much for the privilege that is ours in the midst of a busy week, that we can begin the week by focusing our attention on that which is your word, your speech to us. Thank you that the Holy Spirit breathed this word out. We pray that he might have his uh, ministry of illumination tonight. We pray that he would unstop deaf ears and uncover blind eyes that he would show us how these great truths apply in our own living and bring about change to a greater degree of Christ-likeness in each of us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If each of us have in our life, as we are told, 15 minutes of fame, uh, empires have a little longer. For the Persians, their moment of fame came in the 400s, sandwiched between the Babylonians and the Greeks. For Xerxes or Ahasuerus, as he is mentioned in your book, I'll call him Xerxes tonight, the uh, king of Persia, his moment came in the 480s BC for about 20 years. When the, Persian, when the Babylonian Empire collapsed, the wealth of Babylon moved to Persia and moved to the capital city of Susa, and with the wealth came many of the Jewish exiles as well. Xerxes was a king who was rather intoxicated with his own wealth and in order to show off his wealth you'll see in chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 that he held a banquet on one occasion which lasted 180 days. Imagine that, six months of total access to an all-you-can-eat food bar. Then he sought to show off the beauty of his queen Vashti and he drunkenly commands that she is to come to him. Verse 12 of chapter 1 says, But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. She wasn't going to come like some trophy to be eyed by the rabble. After, and she refuses. After all, she is the patron of FEMP, the feminist movement of Persia, and she's not going to come. That's a joke, by the way. Um, uh, it would give other women in the empire their ideas. So notice, friends, the irony. Verse 1 tells us that this king Xerxes had control over 127 provinces, but he couldn't control one woman. Verse 19, a royal decree goes out, and the decree is that she is never to appear before him again, and the women's magazines of Persia are to have full access to this story with photos. Verse 22, because every man is to be ruler over his own household, and women need to learn to do as they are told and to avoid Vashti's example. Headlines in the magazines. Xerxes divorces Vashti, or more cryptically, from ravishing to vanishing, the ten-part story of Queen Vashti's downfall. Notice in chapter 2, verse 2, we are in replacement mode. And what is required is someone who is beautiful and a virgin. And it just so happened that there was a Jew at court by the name of Mordecai who had a cousin, Esther, whom he treated like a daughter. Verse 7 tells us she was lovely in both form and features. And Esther pleased the king's eunuch, verse 9, won his favour, and then according to verse 12, goes into 12 months, imagine that, 12 months of preparation before she comes before the king. Now I've heard about someone taking a long time to get ready, but 12 months of cleaning, toning, oiling and perfuming, and verse 16, she comes before Xerxes in the 10th month of the 7th year of his reign, quite specifically an historic occasion, and sure enough, she wins the king's favour and he sets the royal crown upon her head. But would you notice in verse 19 that not everything is happy? because this is an assassination plot against the king, overheard by Mordecai, who tells Esther about it, and the king is saved, and that fact is entered into the annals, the historical record of the reign of King Xerxes. Tuck that in the back of your mind. Chapter 3, the Prime Minister Haman. Here is a man who is full of himself. He decrees that wherever he goes in the empire, everybody is to bow down and show their respect for him. And everybody does just that with one exception. You guessed it, Mordecai the Jew. 
And this so enrages Haman, verse 6 of chapter 3, that he looked for a way of destroying all of the Jews because of what Mordecai had not done to him. And so he tells the king Xerxes that the Jews are traitors and the day is set for their extermination. Look at verse 13. Dispatches were sent by courier to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women, little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Why? Because one Jew, Mordecai, would not bow before this egocentric Prime Minister Haman. Why not? Well, the only hint we have is in verse 1, which tells us that Haman was an Agagite, one of Israel's oldest enemies. Well, the Jews know that their day is up. They go into sackcloth and ashes. A message comes from Mordecai to Esther, please go into the king's presence. Plead for your people. Tell him that he's been told untruths. Tell him that you yourself are a Jew. But the problem is, is that Xerxes is the master of all who come to him. The previous queen was banished for not coming on command. Now he hasn't called Esther, should she go without being invited. And if you look in chapter 4, verse 11, you'll see that she says, he hasn't called me for 30 days. 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. But notice that Mordecai urges her on. Look at verse 14. If you remain silent and distant at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish, and who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And so Esther determines, in courage, that she will go. Look at verse 16. I will go to the king, even though it is against the law to come without being invited. And if I perish, then I perish. Well, the drama comes and goes. According to chapter 5, she comes before the king and he says, Oh, yes, I forgot. I've got a king. How are you? How are you going? It's good to see you. And then he says, What, what is it that you request? Ask up to half my provinces and they'll be yours, half my kingdom. In other words, he would be willing to give her 63 of the provinces. But look at what she asked, chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. They go to dinner at her home. They ask, what is it that she requests? And she says, my request to you, O king, is that you will come back tomorrow night for a second dinner party with the Prime Minister Haman. And so the king and, the Haman, and Haman leave. On the way home, Haman is further enraged because as he's going through the streets of Susa, all the people are bowing to him, but one man stands erect, and that is Mordecai the Jew. So that by the time he gets home, his wife doesn't have to ask him what sort of a day he had. He is enraged and he is angry. And so his wife, chapter 5, verse 14, whose name is Zeresh, and all his friends tell him this. Have a gallows built 75 feet high. Ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. Nice lady that he's married to. Yeah, build him, hanging up there. And so Haman goes to sleep. And when you're anticipating a great day the next day, you sort of tend to run through the day in your mind, don't you? I'll have the gallows built, 75 feet high. I'll see that Mordecai the Jew dangle on the gallows. And then I'll go and sip Chardonnay with the royal family and have another banquet with them like the one I had tonight. What a great day it will be. Chapter 6, the turning point. The king can't sleep. What better way of getting off to sleep than reading the historical record of his own reign? And he calls for the annals, and it just so happens that he's given the annals about the assassination plot which was averted against him by Mordecai in chapter 2. And he asks an attendant, what was done for that man who helped, avoid, uh, who helped avert that assassination plot? Nothing was done for him. At that moment, the prime minister enters the court, verse 6 of chapter 6. And he says to Haman, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Haman is so egocentric that he thinks the king is talk talking about him. And so he says, well, I believe that a robe that the king has worn should be placed on his shoulders. 
and a horse upon which the king has ridden should be provided for the man and he should be led through the street and the person leading him should say this is what happens to the king the, to the man the king delights to honor and if you look at verse 10 what an incredible thing how it would have been to be there go at once the king commanded Haman get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate do not neglect anything you have recommended so Haman got the robe and he got the horse he robed Mordecai it wouldn't have been wonderful to be there watching him road Mordecai led him on horseback through the city streets proclaiming before him this is what well through gritted teeth probably this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor chapter 7 to the Queen's place for dinner the request is put again what is it that you would like to request verse 3 O king please spare my people they are marked for destruction and it is an unjust marking. Who has done this thing, the king says. Look at verse 6. The adversary and enemy is this vile Haman. And the king now is confused. He goes out into the garden to gather his thoughts. And when he goes out into the garden to gather his thoughts, his prime minister Haman falls on the sofa on which the queen is lying. At that moment, the king comes back in and he sees his prime minister lying on the sofa with the queen and says, watch to his attendant, what should be done to the man who would molest the queen in the king's presence? Well, your worship, well, your majesty, the attendant says, there happens to be a 75-foot gallows outside and it's empty and it's waiting and so sure enough that's exactly what happened chapter 7 verse 10 the king said hang him on it so they hanged Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai then the king's fury subsided another edict was issued which allowed the people to defend themselves chapter 9 verse 5 the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword killing and destroying them and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. Chapter 9, verse 18, the Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and on the 15th they rested and made a day of feasting and joy, a new feast, the Feast of Purim. And the very last verse of this narrative is in chapter 10, verse 3. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. My friend, I put it to you that this particular book in the canon of Holy Scripture is quite a unique and remarkable book. In fact, in all of literature, this is quite a unique and remarkable book. Who are your main characters? Xerxes. Vashti comes and goes, Mordecai, Esther, Haman. Which is the book that comes before this in the canon of Scripture? Just have a look back. It is the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is all about Yahweh. It is all about God. In fact, in Nehemiah, in almost every chapter of Nehemiah, you have Nehemiah bowing his knee and praying to Yahweh, interceding, giving him thanks, giving him praise. The book of Nehemiah is dominated, one, by prayer, and two, by the presence of God, who is named again and again and again. And by strong, strong contrast, we then move into the book of Esther, and in the book of Esther, God is never named, not once. His hand is the most influential hand on every page. But his hand is a hidden hand. He is never acknowledged by any character. And as you read through the narrative, you think, surely, surely someone's going to name Yahweh. Someone's going to name Jehovah. Someone's going to name God. And you come to the end, chapter 10, verse 3. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to, the, to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, always speaking up for the welfare of the Jews. Surely unique in all literature. I know of no other piece of literature in which the main character is so dominant but is never named. And here in Esther, God is never named. And yet you see coincidence after coincidence. It just so happened that Mordecai was at court when a new queen was needed and it just so happened that he had a young cousin who was beautiful in form and features. 
It just so happened that Esther wins the eunuch's favour and takes his advice. It just so happened that Mordecai overhears the plot to kill the king and goes unrewarded at the time. It just so happened that Xerxes can't sleep he asks for the annals and he has given the particular record of the, uh, how he escaped assassination and that the man who helped him to do that, no reward was given to him. And Haman was just at the court in time to tell the king what should happen to the man the king delights to honour. And Esther does not make her request at the first dinner party but she makes her request at the second dinner party after the gallows are built and after Xerxes has had his sleepless night and determines to honour Mordecai. And Haman is just on the sofa, just at the moment, with the queen, that the king re-enters the room. Coincidence after coincidence after coincidence. And my friend, you can make ex uh, natural explanations all the time about such coincidental happenings. If you look back to chapter 6, verse 13, it's probably Haman's friends who come closest. What do they say, chapter 6, verse 13? Since Mordecai, Haman's friends tell him, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. Surely you will come to ruin. Friends, we are seeing in the book of Esther the hidden hand of God humbling the self-exalted Haman and lifting up God's humbled people. Is this coincidence? Is this fatalism? Is this case or are whatever will be, will be? No. The book of Esther is showing us a consistent theme, that there is a controlling, purposeful, powerful, hidden hand at work. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I read in narrative sections of the Old Testament, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Esther, Nehemiah, Ezra, you think, there's nothing in Esther that says, now this is how this applies to new covenant believers today, point one, two, three, four. So what are we to do with it when we read it in our quiet time, in our devotional life? I always think that right at, in the middle of the narrative sections of the Old Testament is a group of books called wisdom literature. And wisdom literature helps us see beneath the surface of all the events and all the activities of the narrative. Esther tells us what happened. Wisdom takes us beneath the surface to see why this happened and how this happened. So let's allow the wisdom of Proverbs to interpret Esther. Go over in your Bibles, I think, to page 654 and you'll come to Proverbs chapter 21. Have a look at the last two verses of Proverbs chapter 21. And how's this for an interpretive key to the book of Esther? The writer of wisdom says this, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 30, there is no wisdom, there is no insight, there is no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Now the psalmist said the same, why is it that the nations rage and the people's plot against the Lord and his anointed? But they do it in vain. There is no insight. There is no wisdom, there is no plan that can succeed against the Lord's purposes. What are you seeing here in the book of Esther? The Lord uses Mordecai's integrity and Esther's courage and they act in ways of wisdom of which they are not aware. Why didn't she speak up? Why didn't he speak up and say she's Jewish? Why didn't she make her request at that first dinner party? She couldn't have known what was going to happen between the first dinner party and the second dinner party. It is God who is superintending all things. And if God is superintending all things, what we are reading in Esther we've read before. Doesn't Esther remind you of Moses? The feast of Passover grew up around Moses who was also adopted. The feast of Purim grew up around Esther who was also adopted and both hid their Jewishness for a time. And doesn't Mordecai, when you read about him, he reminds me of Joseph. Both took a stand of great courage. Joseph against Potiphar's wife, Mordecai against Haman. It was Pharaoh's inability to interpret his dreams, which he had in his sleep, and it was Xerxes' sleeplessness, which was the key which brought Mordecai to prominence. And of course it was Joseph 
and Mordecai, who both came, became number two in their empire. You see, what we are seeing here is that God uses people and people who are motivated for evil, but he uses their evil for great good. Joseph's brothers, Haman in his egocentric pride, and yet God brought great good from the situation. Whenever we're in the Old Testament, God's hand of blessing is seen in political triumph and in military triumph. But if you notice that when you get through to the New Testament, all that is foreshadowing the great spiritual victory which we see in the New Testament, in which God's enemies crucify his son. And this is the means of great deliverance whereby Christ devours Satan's greatest weapon, the weapon of death and brings about an eternal deliverance for his people. How did God do it? He did it by coincidence. There was a weak-willed Roman governor who just happened to have a special relationship with the Jews. But there was a hidden hand bringing about God's sovereign purpose. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Look back, if you would, to the very first verse of Proverbs chapter 21. What a magnificent verse and a reminder this is to us. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a watercourse wherever he pleases. And yet Xerxes did not know God. But Xerxes in the book of Esther is named over 100 times and yet Yahweh is not named once and yet Xerxes is Yahweh's pawn. He is the one at work beneath the surface. A pharaoh can't understand a recurring dream. A king can't sleep at night. Nothing escapes God's sovereign control. Recently, I was reading an article about our Prime Minister in Australia, Julia Gillard, our first lady Prime Minister in the history of our nation. The man said a number of things about uh, Julia Gillard, but he said that he noticed that in her past, she is a lady who has found it very difficult to trust other people easily. I don't think she's unique in that way. We all learn very early on in life that nobody is to be trusted absolutely. When our mother leads us to school, we can trust her while she's with us, but then when the school gate closes and she's on the other side and you're in the playground, you can't trust your mum at that point because she's simply not able to be with you there and exercise her power and influence with you there. In order to trust absolutely, I need to know that someone, the person I trust, knows all things about all things. Two, that the person has my good and loves me at heart. And thirdly, that the person is able to control all events in my life and in history. And there is only one, therefore, who is worthy of such absolute trust, and that is God himself. The Lord is the Lord. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and therefore there is no wisdom, there is no insight, there is no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Now this, my friends, I put it to you, is the great truth that is going to carry, carry on and sustain you through the difficulties, through the troughs and peaks of human experience. For the 26 years that I have been at our college, there has been a near neighbour to our college in a residential area in Sydney where our college is located, who has been a determined enemy of the college. For 26 years, this man will often ring and express his anger that our college is there, express his absolute uh, atrocious attitude to the college, that we are expanding. And I know when I listen to that man go on and on on the phone, he tells me that he will fight us with his dying breath. And I think whatever you do, you're doing for us God's best. You do your worst and it's actually God's best. I don't tell him that, he's already angry enough. <laughs> very frustrating for him, but very comforting for me. What is it that will carry you through? When you do face difficulties, it is to know that God alone, the all-loving, all-knowing and all-powerful God, is worthy of all your trust. In my first parish in rural New South Wales, Black Soil Plain, 700 miles northwest of Sydney, in a town called Wee War, most of our congregation there were Americans who had come to Australia to grow cotton. 
I remember one October, the first October we were there going out to a cotton property. We were having an afternoon tea in this man's property and he showed me his cotton which was about that far above the ground and in a very frail and fragile state. He showed me his wheat which is in head almost ready to harvest. That afternoon a great storm came from the north and as we gathered in the house I saw hail the size of which is a city boy I had never seen before. It was consistently the size of a golf ball. And that hail hit and it must have destroyed the cotton, he couldn't replant it, and taken the head off the wheat, he would have lost the lot. He stood to lose a fortune, if not everything. When the hailstorm was over, we went out and looked at our cars, which would, had been pelted by the hail. And as we're standing there, I'm with this man, the owner of the property. One of his labourers, a man who was on a wage, comes down the road, and he comes up to his boss, and he said this, well, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away and he spat on the ground in front of him. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. <coughs> and my friend who stood to lose everything said, you finish that verse. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now my friend, can you say that? The proud Haman, the principled Mordecai, the courageous Esther, the stubborn Pharaoh, the weak Pontius Pilate, the fickle crowds today with their palms, but this coming Friday, crucify him. Perfect love, total knowledge, absolute power. Sitting in the doctor's surgery, waiting for the results of the tests. Going to work knowing that the latest sales figures for the month are being released today. Looking for your name on the list of the results of an essay. Will the rains come? When they come, will the rain stop? What is the bank of interest going to do this month with interest rates? What effect is this going to have on my pension? What effect is this going to have on my investment? And here is my teenager, my adolescent, about to make a decision which I fear is going to change his or her life and the course of his or her life. In all of those situations, where are you going to trust? Look at what wisdom says. Chapter 21, verse 1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a watercourse wherever he pleases. Verse, 20, verse 30, There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Where do you trust? That's sort what of Paul says. Paul, Paul develops, you notice in Romans 8, 28, a sandwich. He describes us from a human point of view, for those who love God... And then he describes us from a divine point of view. That is, to those who have been called according to his purpose. Now that is the sandwich. That is the two pieces of bread. He gives us the spiritual principle in between. But he has qualified it by saying that this spiritual principle only applies for those, one, who love God, two, who've been called according to his purpose. For those people, you can be sure that in all things, God is working for good. And the second qualifier is what is the good to make me more like Jesus. No matter what comes my way in the rest of 2011 and into 2012, whatever it is, I love him, I'm called by him. The sovereign God will work all things for my good to make me like Christ. I ask you, my friend, are you trusting here have you offloaded the weight of your confidence on the only one who is absolutely trustworthy? Don't trust in your friends. Don't trust in your training. Don't even trust ultimately in your spouse or your family or your employer. Don't trust there. Don't trust in the economy. Don't trust in the government. The only place where we can trust absolutely is in the God of the hidden hand, knowing that his hand springs from a heart of love. And if you don't trust there, then where will you trust? Let's pray. You are good and kind, compassionate, gracious and merciful. You just don't say that but you back your words with deeds. We see your goodness, love, kindness, grace, 
mercy at the cross of the Lord Jesus. We see your power in the empty tomb and the guarantee of our right relationship with you. But tonight we worship you particularly because we know that you are sovereign over all the events of life. None of us can foresee what is going to happen, but this narrative of Esther reminds us that there is a hand, and no matter how hidden it may seem, it is a real hand, and it is a hand which springs from a heart of love. It is your hand, it is your heart, Lord God Almighty, our Father, and we trust wholeheartedly in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.